med surg students in this lecture i'm going to review connective tissue disorders connective tissue disorders are a type of autoimmune disorders and in autoimmune disorders something triggers the body to reject itself in other words the body attacks itself this lecture will cover course outcomes one two and three oftentimes people with autoimmune disorders or connective tissue disorders um, will be cared for by members of the interdisciplinary team. And as an LPN or as an RN, as a member of the interdisciplinary team, you will collaborate with the members of this team. And an example is, for example, somebody with rheumatoid arthritis. They're going to be followed by a physical therapist, but they're also going to possibly see occupational therapists. So you would have to collaborate with the members of the healthcare team um, to promote patient success. And then also when we relate the appropriate diagnostics, you're going to see that most patients with uh, connective tissue disorders or autoimmune disorders uh, will have ele elevated inflammatory markers. Um, and also they're going to undergo some type of pharmacological um, therapies that you're going to have to do patient teaching about because there is no cure for these disease, but they can be managed with lifestyle changes and also medications. In this lecture, we're going to talk about connective tissue disorders, which are autoimmune disorders. In autoimmune disorders, we've established that the body, for some reason, is attacking itself. So the main diseases or disorders, I should say, that we're going to talk about are systemic lupus erythematous, um, abbreviated SLE, scleroderma. I'm only going to really say one thing about scleroderma. It results in thick skin, okay, but it also thickens the organs on the inside, which is why it gets progressively worse. But um, patients are going to present with waxy, thick skin. My mother-in-law has scleroderma. And um, when she started aging, people thought she had a facelift because her skin on her face became like thick and there were no wrinkles and it was very waxy. Um, rheumatoid arthritis is another condition we're going to talk about. Many of these conditions have all this, some of the same signs and symptoms, so they present kind of the same way with maybe a little um, defining feature that is different, okay? Um, they are all going to have increased blood tests of inflammatory markers, which are the ANA, the CRP, and the ESR, and I'm going to explain what these are later in this lecture. Okay, so we're going to talk about lupus first, and I've already established that's an autoimmune disorder, so the body attacks itself for some reason, okay? So patients with lupus have chronic inflammation of the connective tissue. And the connective tissue is, you know, supporting tissue in the body. Okay, so they'll have periods of exacerbation and remission. And this is with all the autoimmune or connective tissue disorders. So they'll enjoy periods of remission, but they'll also have exacerbation po possibly brought on by stress or sunlight. Um, so, you know, we'll have to do some teaching about how to care for themselves. Discord lupus erythematous. So discord refers to the skin. So if they have discord rashes, it's going to be on their skin. And this form of lupus only attacks the skin. So in other words, they'll have rashes on their skin. Or there'll be systemic lupus erythematous, which is the one we talk about most often. The risk factors include women mostly, uh, lupus affects women mostly between the ages of 15 to 40, and those of Asian, Hispanic, and Black descent. And it's also exacerbated by prolonged sun exposure. Sun exposure. So we're going to have to teach people with lupus to stay out of the sun. So the signs and symptoms, or how somebody may present, um, is they may have painful or swollen joints and muscle pain. Now, the difference between SLE and rheumatoid arthritis with the joint swelling and pain is that the joints don't become disfigured over time. The people with SLE are going to have a red rash. It's usually called a malar rash, which means a butterfly rash on the face, which is pretty distinctive. 
and SLE is the only autoimmune uh, disorder that presents with the mallow rash, the butterfly rash. They're going to have profound weakness and fatigue. This is anybody with an autoimmune disorder. Um, they, in lupus, they may lose their hair, so they may have alopecia. Uh, in lupus, they're going to present also with mouth, ulcer, mouth ulcers. They could have a poor appetite, which results in weight loss. They may have edema and swollen glands. They'll have abnormal menses. Usually it attacks women more than men. In an unexplained fever, that's why they're going to need to take their temperature daily and sensitivity to the sun. Now, those were a lot of signs and symptoms I presented in the earlier slide. If that doesn't work for you, you can remember the mnemonic MD SOAP brain. So M stands for the mallow rash, and that's the butterfly rash that people with lupus get on their face. They could have a discoid rash, and remember I told you there is a form of lupus that is discoid, meaning it only affects the skin. But a discoid rash would be rashes in other areas of their body, not just the cheeks. Serositis. So serositis refers to inflammation of the serous membranes, which refers to pericardial, pleural, and abdominal, the peritoneum. Okay, those are serous membranes. So what this means for somebody for lupus is that they could get pericarditis, which means inflammation around the heart. They can get pleural inflammation. Um, so you'll hear like a friction rub with both of these, okay? And it sounds like two pieces of leather rubbing together when you're auscultating those areas. Also, they could have what's called... Um, pleurisy, which means that it hurts when somebody breathes in. They're going to have pain on inspiration. Um, and they can also have abdominal signs like, for example, constipation or abdominal pain. Um, the, the next one is oral ulcers. People with lupus often have oral ulcers. They can have arthritis, anemia, and alopecia. In fact, they could, they could suffer from pancytopenia. And we talked about pancytopenia in the cancer lecture. So remember to review the nursing implications of anemia, neutropenia, and thrombocytopenia, okay? Photosensitivity is another symptom. In other words, the sun is going to exacerbate their symptoms. So you'll have, we'll talk more about this later. Um, blood cell destruction, pancytopenia, because the spleen enlarges, and every time the spleen enlarges, it acts like a Pac-Man and eats up the blood cells, okay? So that's why they have pan, which means all blood cells, cyto, which means cells, and penia, which means low, so low blood cells. Um, renal involvement, people with lupus often develop chronic renal failure. ANA elevated, which we talked about, that's one of the inflammatory markers. It's an immunological defect, and there are neurological manifestations, like they could become confused, have brain fog, etc. Here's a picture you can look at for the signs and symptoms as well. I also want to talk about something called Raynaud's phenomenon, uh, which is refers to arterial vasospasm. And people with connective tissue disorders or autoimmune disorders can also suffer from Raynaud's phenomenon. And what you're going to see is skin color changes, usually in the hands. They'll go white, they'll go red, blue. Um, so the skin does change. And the reason is because they're exposed to like maybe cold, okay? So they get cold or numb skin and then it turns warm and tingling and throbbing, and then they have the painful sores on their fingers. So what you tell people is, first of all, they shouldn't smoke. They shouldn't go outside when it's cold, or I should say they should wear multiple layers of clothing when they go outside. And, for example, people grabbing, like, frozen meat and such out of the refrigerator probably need to wear gloves to do that. This is what the mallow rash or butterfly rash would look like on a person with lupus. Okay, let's talk about the nursing care of lupus. 
Um, so we want to monitor for pain in, in our patients with lupus, what, you know, when they have a flare-up because they're going to maybe have decreased mobility. They're going to be fatigued. Remember, I talked about pancytopenia and anemia. So a reduction in hemoglobin and red blood cells is going to make somebody fatigued. So we ask them to pace themselves. They're going to need to alternate periods of activity with rest, and they need to plan that throughout their day. They may have high blood pressure, which results in edema, low urine output, high BUN, and high creatin. These symptoms that I just talked about are symptoms of renal failure. So you need to be on high alert for these type of symptoms. When somebody has edema, oftentimes the first time you're, the first place you're going to see it is under their eyes, so periorbital edema. And that's because the skin under your eyes is the thinnest skin on your body, so oftentimes that's the first place edema is going to show up. You're going to monitor for that pleuritic pain. Remember I talked about the serous membranes being irritated. So you might hear a pleuritic friction rub, or you may also hear a pericardial friction rub. So you may also hear both of those, and they may complain about it hurts when they breathe it, okay? They could have decreased lung sounds because the lungs are restricted in movement. Um, they could have polyarthritis, and that means arthritis in many joints, arthralgia, that means inflammation of the joints, in my, my algias, which is like muscle pain, okay? They need to eat small, frequent meals because they could have abdominal pain. Remember, the peritoneum may be irritated. They need to limit salt in their diet, use supplements between meals, and please medicate your patients for pain so that they can increase their mobility or maintain their mobility. Um, I know you're just learning these medications and pharmacology. I'm just going to say a few things, okay? They're going to be placed on NSAIDs, which are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Very important that you're checking their stools for TARI stools because this, with corticosteroids, can cause ulcers, GI ulcers. So you want to make sure there's no blood in their stool. They're going to be on corticosteroids, which are a type of anti-inflammatory as well, immunosuppressants, and anti-malarial drugs. So they can be on any type of combination of these sorts of drugs. And what's going to be important for you to remember is that you have to teach the importance of the medication regime. In other words, people with these type of disorders should not miss their medications. They need to be very strict on taking their medications at the proper time and in the proper sequence. Client teaching for lupus, you want to tell um, patients to minimize their sun exposure. So that means wearing a wide hat, long sleeves and pants when they're outside. They, everybody needs to use sunscreen, but especially people with lupus, and it needs to be 30 SPF. You want to report edema because that could mean they're going into renal failure flu-like symptoms and flushing because remember I said that they can have periods of exacerbation which means the disease presents itself in periods of remission. So if they're going through a period of remission and all of a sudden they have flu-like symptoms and flushing, they're probably going into a period of exacerbation and they need to be in touch with their rheumatologist or their provider. Okay, They need to avoid harsh hair treatments because the disease does present with alopecia. You want to make sure they're keeping their hair healthy. So, in other words, not giving their hair another reason to fall out. You want them to apply lotion to their skin, BID. The skin is going to be sensitive, so you want them to pat dry, not, you know, rub the skin with the towel. And you absolutely have to tell them to stay away from crowds and sick people. Okay, I'm going to talk about client teaching for Raynaud's. I kind of already went over this, but it's important, so I think we're going to talk about it again. You want to teach um, patients to wear multiple layers of clothes in the cold weather because cold weather is going to cause arterial spasm, so you want to avoid that. Also, instruct them to walk several times a day to promote circulation, which is good advice for everybody, not just people with lupus or Raynaud's. Um, no smoking or nicotine products, if you recall, 
I talked about in the cancer lecture that, or in the periop lecture, that nicotine causes vasoconstriction, and we certainly don't want to add to the vasoconstriction they may, you know, have from Raynaud's. We do not want them to elevate their extremities because this is an arterial problem. Um, if you elevate the extremity, it's going to make it worse. And this will make more sense to you when we talk about peripheral vascular disease. Avoid triggers and manage stress. Good advice for everybody, but especially people with Raynaud's. And you don't want them touching cold objects. Remember, I gave you that uh, example earlier of wearing gloves to take uh, meat out of the freezer or anything cold out of the freezer. Um, the most common type of medication I've seen prescribed for this Raynaud's phenomenon is a can uh, calcium channel blocker. You don't have to worry about, you know, knowing about calcium channel, channel blockers for this exam. I just thought I'd put it out there. Um, so if you do run into somebody with clinical, you can put the pieces together. Okay, we're going to talk about gout. This is another systemic problem. It's due to hyperuricemia, so a uric acid level greater than 6.8. Okay, so just a high uric acid level, okay? And it could be due to drugs, which you'll be learning about, like um, some drugs that do result in high uric acid, diet such as eating organ meats or shellfish, or overproduction of um, uric acid. Uh, the uric acid crystals form in the joints if there's too much uric acid in the body, and it results in severe joint pain. I don't know if you know anybody that has had gout, but they often um, they often have big toe problems. Like that's where it usually shows up first. So they need to limit alcohol. They need to go on a low purine diet. Um, no organ meats or shellfish, and limit physical and emotional stress and adhere to their medication regime. All patients with these types of disorders need to adhere to their medication regime. Okay, fibromyalgia. This is a disorder that results in chronic pain, stiffness, and tenderness of the joints and swollen joints. So much like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, the defining feature of rheumatoid arthritis that's different than fibromyalgia and lupus is that the joints become not only swollen and tender and stiff, they become disfigured. And I'm going to show you a picture of that later. Really important. Um, they're going to have chronic fatigue, like most autoimmune disorders, so they have to alternate periods of rest with activity. The pain is going to be triggered by palpating trigger joints. And they also have what's called hyperalgesia. In other words, the pain seems out of proportion to what they're complaining about. They have allodynia, which means they have a pain response to non-painful stimuli. So the patient teaching is going to involve teaching patients to manage stress and fatigue. And that is for any autoimmune disorder, and it's good advice for anybody, right? Even a nursing student, manage your stress and fatigue. They need to develop a good sleep routine. Sleep is, like, so important to your immunity, to feeling better, to just feeling refreshed in the morning. It's super important. They should all, any anybody with an autoimmune disease should engage in low-impact exercise. We always want to promote mobility, and they must adhere to their medication regime. And you'll learn about these medications in pharmacology and no alcohol, and that goes for most of the um, connective tissue disorders. You don't want your patients drinking alcohol because two alcoholic drinks a day can reduce your immunity. Okay, rheumatoid arthritis. This is where the WBCs attack joints. It's going to be on both sides, in other words, bilaterally, so on both sides of the body, um, symmetrical joints are going to be affected. They'll have connective tissue around the joint that becomes inflamed and disfigured. And like all connective tissue disorders or autoimmune disorders, they're going to have periods of remission uh, alternating with periods of exacerbation. Okay, take a look at this hand of a person who has rheumatoid arthritis, and this would be very late stage. They have what's called a swan neck deformity of their fingers. 
and they also have a boutonniere deformity of their uh, thumb. See how it's kind of like curved right there and see how the joints um, are kind of crooked. Okay, so that's what I meant about disfigured joints. The connective tissue around it, like the tendons, etc., are disfigured. So that's why it looks like this, okay? Now you can remember the expected findings of rheumatoid arthritis with the mnemonic ears. So they're going to have early morning stiffness, and it could take them up to an hour to like warm up their body to where they can move after they get up in the morning, um, which is different than other types of arthritis, okay? So they are going to have stiffness waking up. They're going to have an elevated temperature during periods of exacerbation. The arthritis occurs in um, more than three joints, but always the hands are involved. It could, could involve other um, joints, like in the feet. So usually it's small joints first. Rheumatoid factor is going to be elevated. That is another inflammatory marker. They'll have rheumatoid nodules. You can Google that to see what it looks like. And, of course, they're going to have uh, radiographic changes on their x-rays. The arthritis is symmetrical, and they can only be diagnosed after having it for six weeks, like the same kind of pain and um, joint stiffness and tenderness for six weeks. So the laboratory markings you're going to see is a high WBC, of course, because that indicates inflammation. C-reactive protein, which remember early in this presentation, I said that these connective tissue disorders all have increased inflammatory markers. Now, these re markers, C-reactive protein, elevated sedimation rate, ESR, anti-nuclear antibody titer, ANA, and rheumatoid factor, are nondescript inflammatory markers. And what I mean by that is there are other conditions that can also elevate these laboratory values, okay? So it's kind of just means that we know there's inflammation in the body, we just don't know what's causing it. But what you'll see in all these patients with, uh, in, with these connective tissue disorders, they will have elevated markers. Okay, nursing care. For somebody with rheumatoid arthritis, you want to encourage movement of the joints. And you want to encourage movement as tolerated. You would never want a patient with joint pain to go past the area, like past the motion that's going to cause more pain. Okay, so it has to be as tolerated. You want people to do exercise daily. Use assistive devices if needed. You want to make sure the environment is safe. For example, um, people can get rheumatoid arthritis in their feet. So you want to make sure fall precautions are maintained, okay? They're going to be on a medication regime, and I know you might not have had this in pharmacology, but when you have it in ph pharmacology, you'll understand that patients must adhere to the medication regime that is prescribed to them because the medications work in conjunction with each other, okay, to promote the best outcome for patients. So some of the teaching that's going to be involved is applying heat or cold therapy. For example, remember I said people with rheumatoid arthritis have morning stiffness. So one of the things that could help them is a hot shower in the morning. Well, because a hot shower is going to get your um, connective tissue to feel more supple and you can move better. Uh, for pain in the hands, they can use warm paraffin wax. I don't know if you've ever done this therapy, but... You know, you can get it done while you go to get your nails done. It, it feels so good. So I can imagine on somebody that has painful joints, this would feel wonderful. Um, if they have edema, you can, they can use cold therapy. Um, they need to report fever and infections. In fact, anybody with an autoimmune disease should be taught to te te take their temperature daily and report an increase because that could be the first sign of an exacerbation. And as with everybody with autoimmune diseases, you want them to alternate periods of rest with activity. They're going to be anybody that is going to be discharged from the hospital, the doctor's office, the, you know, outpatient clinic needs a medication teaching, needs medication teaching, okay, because they're going to be on multiple medications 
to try to help them live with these disorders. So it's really important you explain that they need to adhere to the medication regime.